the Stasi Records Archive in Berlin. Remnants of the former East German Ministry for State Security are still in storage here. Millions of files, reports, photos, index cards. One particular relict of the past was left behind by the head of the ministry himself, Erich Mielke. A red photo album documenting some of the most decisive moments in his career. The construction of the Berlin Wall, declared as the anti-fascist protection rampart. This photo album records what happened on August 13, 1961, and the days that followed. The book's condition reveals how often it has been looked through. In Mielke's eyes, the tale of the Berlin Wall was a tale of triumph. The situation that unfolded after August the 13th proves that building an anti-fascist protection rampart was the good and right decision for the people of East Germany. The working class seized power never to let it go again. This is Erich Mielke's office, where he began each day, every morning at 7 o'clock sharp, as East Germany's Minister for State Security. The minister would call first thing and ask what was new. Had anything happened overnight? What was going on at the border and passport checkpoints? What about the people we were tracking? Something new came up every day, and he always wanted to know everything. Milke had just one aim, to keep an eye on everything happening in the country and at the border, to keep it all under control, to deter all enemies and traitors. The minister placed great value on being informed immediately to ensure the appropriate response, so we could coordinate all the necessary measures. And when things came down to it, he was relentless. Erich Milke dedicated over 28 years of his career to ensuring that the Berlin Wall was insurmountable. For him and his ministry, this was a never-ending challenge. To Milke, the wall was what ensured that his party and the state security apparatus stayed in power. He saw his ministry as the shield and sword of the Socialist Unity Party, the SED. We who serve the Ministry for State Security stand at the ready to unconditionally fulfill any mission the party and government assigns to us. To that, we give our word. The Ministry for State Security gained importance when the wall was built. Its responsibilities grew and so surveillance became more total. The entire intelligence apparatus expanded dramatically. Milke's conference room. Normally, East German offices would hang a portrait of the state leader at the head of the table. But Milke had an oil painting of the Berlin Wall hung instead. It depicts the Brandenburg Gate, forever shielded with state and party firmly secured behind it. August 13, 1961, in Berlin. Images that shook the world. Over two million people had fled East Germany. The isolated country was nearing collapse. SED party heads were convinced shutting the border crossing to West Berlin would solve the problem once and for all. Two days in advance, Milke had informed his closest associates of the planned measures. The Stasi's operation was given the code name ROSE. The minutes of the top secret meeting read, today we enter a new phase of our Czechist work. Steps are being taken to end desertion from the Republic. While combat groups and border patrols visibly took a position to seal off the East German sector, 
The Stasi operated in the shadows. At the top secret Operation Rose meeting, it was further decided that enemy forces are to be apprehended immediately, without a fuss and by any means necessary. These were preventative measures. An uprising like that on June 17, 1953 could not be allowed to happen again. Back then, state security had failed and the Soviet army had had to step in. The building of the wall was a limitus test for Erich Mielke and his ministry. His photo album also documents the call to arms on August 23rd. It was a show of power in East Berlin. Party leader Walter Ulbricht followed by Erich Honecker, the mastermind behind the Berlin Wall. The minister was on stage as well, relegated at the time to the second row. He appeared tense. The flood of refugees to West Berlin was endless. Despite orders to shoot, people still found holes in the barbed wire fencing or windows along the border to jump out of. The border police were overwhelmed, and so Mielke took action. As minister, I need to be the best. I am responsible for maintaining safety in this country. To me, whatever the party decides is set in stone, and I must enforce it with rigor and severity. After discussing the matter with Erich Honecker, the party secretary for security and Milke's direct superior, the Stasi organized the evacuation of the border houses, took over the securing of the sewage system, had everything barred. The ministry targeted anyone attempting to flee and anyone suspected of it. Our job was to keep things quiet and uneventful. We couldn't do that in the years leading up to 1961 because the borders were still open. Now the issue had been taken seriously and any attempts to breach the border or flee had to be stopped. By the end of 1961, the Stasi had arrested 3,000 people suspected of planning an escape or who were opposed to the wall. Many were put on trial. One event was particularly embarrassing. In the first months of the wall, a border officer, hired to prevent escapes, managed to flee himself. In my eyes, those In my eyes, those were all wretched scoundrels. We saw them as traitors who were betraying our country. No matter their motive, be it political or economic, nothing justified fleeing the country. Who is who? To Milke, this was the decisive question, and only the Stasi could find the answer. Soon his ministry began inspecting and spying on anyone working at the border crossings. Each border patrol was assigned a full-time ministry employee as supervisor. Each barrack was to have its own informant. And so the Stasi took total control over all officers patrolling the border. Just a few months after the wall had been built, Erich Milke moved to his new headquarters. In the entranceway, his great idol, Felix Dzerzhinsky, head of the Soviet secret police organization, the Cheka. Despite their success, Milke demanded his staff remain vigilant. 
Deserters of the Republic have essentially been liquidated, but it would be a mistake to assume that means our enemy has become less active. Instead, in response to these measures, the ultras from Bonn and NATO agents have employed even more cunning tactics to reach their criminal goals. By and by, as the wall was fortified, escaping over the border became increasingly difficult. So refugees turned to evading the SED regime and Mielke's ministry in daring escape tunnels under the wall. The task of liquidating moles was entrusted to a special unit within the ministry. They used their intelligence to tear down escape tunnels they learned of, to create ditches and counter tunnels, or to install microphones and motion detectors. Milke Stasi was eager to recruit spies from east and west alike and infiltrate groups attempting to help people escape. It was like war. It was always a defeat when people left. Somewhere the border was not properly secured, and you didn't know that people wanted to leave. And the more there were, or the more active they were, the greater our defeat and our failure. Stasi surveillance footage of a home in West Berlin, recorded on June 28, 1962. The secret operation Maulwürfe, Moles, had been underway for several weeks when an undercover agent, codenamed Panko, discovered plans for an escape tunnel. The Stasi decided to set a trap for the diggers. While the border patrol sealed what they assumed was an entranceway to the tunnel with sand, Stasi agents awaited the tunnel builders underground. As soon as the escape helpers entered the tunnel, the Stasi fired. One helper, Siegfried Nofke, who was trying to bring his wife and son to West Berlin, was killed. For appearance's sake, the informant was also arrested. He later received a medal for his duplicity. Yet despite these efforts, Milka's henchmen couldn't get a handle on the unraveling situation. In early October 1964, 57 people managed to escape to West Berlin through a tunnel in Bernauerstraße. It was the largest mass flight in the history of the wall known to date. The tunnel was discovered just as the escape helpers were leaving. Shots were exchanged, and East German border police officer Egon Schulz was killed. The Stasi took up investigations and secured objects that had been left behind in the tunnel. They included a woman's purse, gas masks, and the alleged murder weapon, a gun belonging to one of the escape helpers. Internal reports by the Stasi's Murder Investigation Committee, as they called it, reconstructed the course of events. They concluded that Egon Schulz had been hit by a bullet from the gun found at the site. But it was a Kalashnikov belonging to a comrade that killed him. The official story that we reported was that tunnel builders had shot and killed Egon Schulz. I only heard the other version of the story years later, and not officially. According to that version of events, Egon Schulz was accidentally shot by one of our own, someone who got nervous and reacted too frantically. But the truth could not be allowed out. So the top secret report was kept under wraps right until the demise of East Germany. With good cause, it was claimed. Who 
And in light of your mother's tears, who mourns for you, her dear son, we denounce before the entire world your murderers, the shooters and their instigators in West Berlin and Bonn. One of the guests present that day was Erich Milke, Honecker's right-hand man. It was his idea to portray the tunnel builders as murderers, and his plan worked. In the West, public support for escape helpers dwindled. Step by step, Milke was handed over the reins for securing the border. The Stasi grew responsible for bolt holes below and above ground. The checkpoints were federal citizens, diplomats, military personnel, and persons with a special permit came and went, were particularly vulnerable. With the wall in place and secured, escaping East Germany was most successful at border crossings, especially with forged documents. In 1964, the Stasi completely took over passport control and searches for wanted individuals. To the intelligence agency, the bottlenecks created by the Cold War were a goldmine for information gathering. Everybody who crossed the border was now subject to inspection by the Stasi. That included the over four and a half million West Berlin inhabitants who crossed over to East Berlin on holidays to visit relatives in the 1960s. Their papers were processed by friendly border staff, undercover Stasi inspectors dressed as East German border troops. But the border remained closed off to East German citizens. Nevertheless, people kept trying to slip through any cracks they could find. Each time the border was penetrated, it was followed up by an analysis. That's why the Ministry for State Security formed working groups to design technologically improved facilities, which were then tested. The testing site was kept top secret. Here, the Stasi examined the effectiveness of various barrier systems. They prepared for all possible contingencies. There were even blockades that could stop a tank. And the staff was trained in how to respond to hostage situations and armed border crossing attempts. Taking a hostage must never be successful. That was our top priority. If there was no time to negotiate, or the captor wasn't willing to negotiate, then there was only one thing left to do, shoot to kill. An internal Stasi training video on operational psychology. What does it mean to act wisely and courageously as a Czechist? What does it mean to live by the laws of war in times of peace? This film will show you how a dangerous enemy was fought and rendered harmless by the clever and courageous actions of a collective of Czechists. Here at Checkpoint Charlie on Friedrichstraße, the East German riot police officer Burkhard Niering demanded entrance to West Berlin by taking a border control officer hostage. Niering was shot dead. Four Stasi members, including the killer, were later interviewed on camera. My weapon was loaded and I shot at the terrorist. He collapsed. Aside the fact that we all felt uneasy and shook at the knees, we were also filled with a sense of pride at having fulfilled our combat mission as Czechists at the border of imperialism. 
The Stasi's dossier later found that Niering had described his military conscription as an infringement upon his right to freedom that had been forced upon him. The report concludes, the body was cremated. The urn burial is pending. Meanwhile, traffic at the border continued as if nothing had ever happened. With as many as 7,600 employees, the Stasi Department for Passport Controls and Person Tracking rose to become the largest of the ministry's operations. It was the perfect disguise for a secret mission. Checking passports was just our cover story. Our actual job was to gather intelligence at the checkpoints. We needed to know who was entering the country, what kind of people were they, where were they going. That was all work that only the Stasi could do. Travelers often mistook these encounters for a harmless chat. But to the Stasi agents, this was a tactical method for filtering incoming traffic. Inconsistencies in someone's travel documents were cause enough to pull them out of line and have a talk with them. If that someone was politically relevant, the corresponding reports were prepared and forwarded to the relevant departments within the ministry. This is how millions of people found their way into the Stasi's filing system. They were scanned for any possible clue and might even be tricked into accidentally providing evidence against someone close to them. Some are registered as potential informants. Each time the friendly border guard stepped up to check your passport, the Stasi was watching. Erich Mielke made good use of the opportunities the Berlin Wall provided him. His employer, the ever-present SED party, was pleased. Milke's most important ally, Erich Honecker, quickly rose through the ranks to become party and state head. Good prospects for his top minister. The 70s marked the detente period of the Cold War. To the Stasi officers, it brought a wide range of new responsibilities. West Germany recognized East Germany as a sovereign nation in the Basic Treaty of 1972, and thus acknowledged its territorial integrity. The aim was to restore good neighborly relations. On the one hand, the wall had to remain psychologically and physically intact. On the other hand, we wanted to present ourselves to the world as open-minded. That meant an ever-increasing amount of work for us. Everything related to detente politics was extremely dangerous to us. The transit agreement aimed to ease travel between East and West Germany. But it also improved the chances of East German citizens to steal away into West Germany hidden inside exiting cars. Despite being denounced as human smugglers, the number of those assisting escapees once again rose. These gangs were engaged in smuggling people out using all sorts of different tactics. The violation of customs seals, installing secret hatches in their trucks, forging customs seals, or simply smuggling people in the trunks of passenger cars. As soon as anyone suspected of being a smuggler entered from the West, the moment he crossed our border, we wouldn't let him out of our sight for even a second. Of course, we had staff and cameras surveilling all highway service areas and rest stops. Right up to the end in 1989, we wrote down the plate numbers of every West Berlin car we saw, every single one. 
the paranoia of a Secret Service agency. Each foiled escape attempt was meticulously reconstructed. Captured refugees, escape helpers, or individuals suspected of being either were sent to the ministry's detention centers. Roughly three quarters of the people detained by the Stasi in the 1980s were accused of emigration or escape offenses. Officially, East Germany had no political prisoners. Whoever they locked up was a criminal. These were all citizens who had violated East German law. Every citizen knew East German law. So if I know the border is closed and I'm not allowed to cross the border, then I need to act accordingly. To the Stasi, crossing the border illegally was a particularly serious offense. Those accused had to be categorized as such. If I knew that a defendant had done all they could to penetrate the border by hook or crook, then of course I had to assume that they would also try to break out of detention. Prisoners were never informed of when their hearings were set. And those presiding over their trials were Stasi members. Milke had seen to it that his ministry remained completely in charge of handling their enemies. There was a desk in the back by the window. The defendant on trial was meant to be facing the light, daylight, so that observers could study his facial expressions better. Simply by studying their characters, you could learn about their intellect, how they responded to certain things, and how to address them. We asked them about everything, even the smallest details. And of course, we also used psychology. The ministry interrogators were well-trained and ruthless. Their job was to draw out confessions. Defendants were not allowed to see anyone. They were never addressed by their given names, but only by their cell numbers. They were ordered to keep their hands above their blankets at night when they slept. And at least every 20 minutes, the light was briefly switched on and then off. Milke knew he could rely on his faithful followers. The head warden was surrounded by like-minded comrades. I didn't find it burdensome at all. Neither did the members of staff who served there in fulfillment of their duty. That was the job they had been entrusted with as members of the Ministry for State Security. And as such, it was never bothersome to us. Celebrations for the 15-year anniversary of the Berlin Wall in August 1976. The people were called to rise up and fight. This time, Erich Mielke was in the front row, looking pleased and confident. Publicly, East Germany was pursuing detente. But this policy of all things is what triggered the mass expansion of the Stasi towards a total surveillance regime. Between 1970 and 1980, the number of those employed by the ministry more than doubled to 80,000. We need to coordinate so effectively that there is no area of security-relevant process that we are not informed about on time. Anywhere we go, we need patriots and confidants, volunteers and contacts who will support us in our fight. There can be no space where at least one of our agencies isn't active. Many ordinary citizens helped to keep watch. 
Who was leaning towards the West? Who could be thinking about leaving? Who was in touch with whom? Every clue, no matter how small or insignificant it seemed, was followed up on. Phone lines and mail were monitored more extensively. Everything was examined and evaluated. We have all this stuff. Anything that had successfully been employed to plan or execute an escape was seized immediately. People tried using diver's equipment to swim across the Spray River or the Baltic Sea, things like that. Some even tried using tethered balloons or hot air balloons, so anything that could be used to build one was also seized. Over 90% of all escape attempts were uncovered and thwarted in advance. Hardly any refugee even made it as far as the death strip. Just like the wall, Milke's Imperium had become indispensable to keeping the SED regime in power. An internal recording of the ministry's 30th anniversary in 1980. Milke was at the height of his power when Erich Honecker promoted him to army general. Outwardly, the SED leader and his faithful minister seemed like two like-minded compatriots. But privately, they were far from friends. It was clear that Milke was the servant, the loyal foot soldier, and Honecker the one giving the orders. Nothing was allowed to interfere with his policies, especially his foreign policy. And the Stasi kept receiving additional responsibilities. In my opinion, this was one of the greatest mistakes of the Ministry for State Security, as an intelligence service and security agency to compensate for the deficits of the party leadership. In 1975, East Germany was signatory to the Helsinki Accords, which included an acknowledgement of basic human rights and fundamental freedoms, such as the freedom of movement. But for all intents and purposes, these exact rights were virtually non-existent within the regime. Nevertheless, a growing number of East German citizens placed formal requests to exit the country and the Stasi handled them all. We cannot let these powers catch us on the back foot. We must always keep the upper hand in this situation. That applies especially to recognizing potential applicants in advance, so we can increase preventative measures. Milke's main efforts were geared towards compelling applicants to withdraw their request. If they did not, they risked discrimination and criminalization. That was the ministry's deterrent. But East Germany was sliding into an economic crisis. Honecka needed a solid currency and goodwill from the West in order to take out credits worth billions. The Stasi was wary of the bind that would put them in. 1984, ein Sonntag. It was in 1984, on a Sunday. I got a call in the morning with orders to immediately contact hundreds of applicants seeking to leave and to inform them that they could relocate the following day. We knew that that was the stupidest possible thing to do. But it was just another one of those lone decisions made by Honecker that had to be carried out to the letter, no matter the disastrous consequences we foresaw. Whoever thought that would lower the number of applications for relocation was obviously being naive. In fact, the opposite came to pass. After those first applicants crossed over, it created a pull effect and inspired thousands of others to follow their lead. One such applicant for relocation in 1984 was 23-year-old Michael Bittner from East Berlin. The Stasi file Morgenthau, or Morning Dew, tells his story. 
It contains three handwritten applications, each one declined. An internal note adds, the necessity for relocation is not given at this time. The Stasi still believed it could convince Bittner, who had fulfilled his military service without any objection, to stay in East Germany. They were wrong. On November 24, 1986, Michael Bittner tried to cross the death strip. 32 shots were fired. As he reached the top of his ladder, Bittner is struck and dies. The incident put Milke in an awkward position. Three days prior, two refugees had been shot and killed along the wall. The celebration of Berlin's 750th anniversary in East Germany's capital was just around the corner. Honecker and Milke both feared international condemnation of the firing orders. And so they decided that Bittner's death had to be kept secret at all costs. And so the Stasi forged an arrest warrant for the deceased. It claimed that a criminal gang of human smugglers had smuggled him out of East Germany. The truth about Michael Bittner's death became a state secret. The whereabouts of his remains are unknown to this day. Thanks to their cover-up, festivities for Berlin's 750th anniversary were undisturbed. One of the main attractions a float commemorating the building of the Berlin Wall. The combat groups of the working class secured the Brandenburg Gate. This image swept around the world. By 1989, Milke had served as minister for 31 years, but he still had no time to rest in the private rooms directly adjacent to his office. Now other images were sweeping around the world. In Hungary, the Iron Curtain was wearing thin. Thousands of East German citizens fled to Prague where they occupied the West German embassy until they were allowed to continue to West Germany in trains passing through East Germany. An increasing number of East Germans were filing applications requesting relocation. By early November 1989, nearly 200,000 applications had been received. Everybody could see that the ship was sinking and we had no room left to maneuver. We had no leg left to stand on. There was no place left to turn. Of course, that had all been different in 1961. Then, slowly but surely, doubt started arising. A sense of helplessness began to spread. It came from the top down as well. And slowly but surely, we became more and more aware of it. At first, the mounting crisis could be pushed aside and ignored. In October 1989, the SED leadership celebrated themselves and 40 years of East Germany. Meanwhile, thousands of protesters marched through East Berlin up to the Palace of the Republic. Mielke's worst nightmare was that they would continue on to the Brandenburg Gate and march to the wall. I don't know what he felt or sensed. All I know is that he thought he could still salvage this, even if that meant we had to shoot. I'm convinced we would have opened fire at the Brandenburg Gate. But the protesters did not march to the gate. In the following weeks, however, more and more people took to the streets, demanding change free elections and the freedom to travel. The SED and Stasi tried to get the spiraling situation under control by releasing a new ordinance, allowing travel and emigration upon request, a small misunderstanding that famously had a groundbreaking effect. As far as I know, this goes into effect immediately, without delay. On the night of November 9th, more and more people flocked to the border crossing at Bornholmer Straße to test this new would-be freedom to travel. Open the gate, the people demand. Stasi Lieutenant Colonel Harald Jäger was on his own that night. 
Eventually, he ordered the border crossing to be opened. There was no superior around to give direction. A lieutenant colonel of the ministry would never have been able to order the border to be opened. Under normal circumstances, that could never have been the case. So there was no need to train for this case. Opening the border crossing would have been considered high treason. The thousands of people standing in front of us were the ones who opened the border. If they hadn't been there, I would never have opened it. To this day, nobody knows where Erich Mielke was that night. Four days after the fall of the Iron Curtain, he held his first and last speech in the People's Parliament. I love all people. Truly, I do. That's what I stand for. In 1992, Erich Mielke was charged with being partially responsible for the killings at the wall. But the proceedings were abandoned due to his failing health. He died in May 2000. Erich Mielke's photo album of victory was not the only legacy found in the state security storerooms. After the fall of the wall, there were also all the nondescript things that the state security took from arrested fugitives and also from the wall's dead and archived. None of this was to be made public. Everything was to remain forever in the dark. <laughs>